Welcome to another Liquid Bullet Productions. With us today is Lockie Campbell. How are you hey, doing? How, are you today? How you doing? Everything's fine, thanks. Yeah, everyone good? Yeah. Right, so so Lockie, you was a former international drug smuggler and spent 12 years in a Chinese prison. Is that correct? That's correct, in Shanghai, yeah. Shanghai, China. Okay, Lockie, before we get into this, can we just step right back to the beginning of uh, where you grew up, where you was born, and, and how your life started out for you? Yes, yeah, certainly. Well, my name's Lachlan Campbell, and I'm from a family of eight. I was born in Glasgow City in 1950. I'm the fifth child. Um, the sort of surroundings that I grew up in was just like post-war. It wasn't long after the war, 1950. So we lived in a single end, one bedroom house with an outside toilet with eight children. My father spent most of my childhood in prison. He was quite a notorious bank robber and hijacker. So <laughs> most of my young, young boy, I just moved from a house to another house to another house because we didn't really have money to pay for rent. My mother was on her own. And they used to call that moonlighting. Moving yeah. from one, basically you're running away from the factor or the rent payer and trying to get another house. So most of my childhood was like that. Then I went to school at the age of five. Um, I quite enjoyed the school years. I was quite interested in sport, but I was always being adopted or in, in, we call it fostered or adopted, sent into childcare because of the big family not having the father to support us. I was in one child home, then moved to another child home. And for years and years, right up until I was about 11 years old, I was in and out of homes. So my childhood wasn't very stable, you could say. Yeah. How, how did you find the homes, uh, Lockie? How, how did that, um, you know, take that on? That, that's done by the government. The government places you in their welfare, welfare system. Yeah, how, how did that impact your life, being being sent to a home? Yeah, well, it's quite hard. To, going back, it, it was quite abusive in a lot of ways, you know, because you're being sent to places outside of your own city. It's a totally different environment, a bit disciplinary. Sometimes you get slapped, you know, or... It wasn't, let's put it this way, it wasn't very, it wasn't a very good experience. It was abusive. Yeah, how many years did you spend in that, sort of all, all through your... Not all through it. Example, I can't remember the exact dates, but let's say I was sent to one, there was one in, in Glasgow called Casimal Child Care Home. I was there from 1955 to 1956. So that's, say, one year in that one. Then move to another one, maybe spend six months there, then move to another one. I was, it was many. It wasn't just, I was maybe Casimo. What, why did they keep moving you? Why did they keep moving you, Lockie? What was the reason? Well, they, they would let you out. So maybe, if I, I'm not really sure, but my mother was probably an alcoholic. So the, the, you're taken away and you're put into care. And then maybe, I don't know, what she sobered up because it's, it's to do with the government, the welfare department. Okay. So she would have to communicate with them. And if they thought, okay, you can have your children back. There was my, my two brothers as well, my two younger brothers. There was three of us. Always, we always went together. So maybe after a couple of months or four or six months, I'm not really sure of the dates, we could return back to the, our house again. Gotcha. And then something else would happen, right. and then they would take, take you away again. 
Right, lovely. It's, uh, so where did it go on from there, Lockie, sort of after the, the sort of them sort of years, the care Yeah, when, when, when I was about 12, I sort of, uh, well, I was going to say I grew up, but when you're 12, you're a bit more aware of things. Yeah. And I used to do some, like, petty theft, you know, like, first of all, stealing apples from trees and stuff like this. And then when I was about 13, 13, yeah, I got put into a remand home, which is like a, an institution for if you commit a crime, you go to this remand home maybe for up to two weeks or one month, <clears throat> then you go to the court and then you get sentenced. So actually, I was actually 15 at the time and I was sentenced to one year in an approved school. And I stayed there for a year. I got out when I was 16 and within something like a month, two months, I got arrested again for breaking into a car and I got sent to Borstal for one year. And then when I came out of Borstal, my father, my father was serving 10 years and he'd finished his 10 year sentence. So we linked up. Uh, my mother had died by then. My mother died very young at 42. But I stayed with my sister Agnes. And she was, only, did, she was only 16. How did the ball stall treat you? I mean, she was some horror stories about that, Lucky. Um, uh, what happens in ball stalls and that? What was that like? In them yeah, ball stall is, uh, again, it's quite disciplinary. Wow. But if I have to be honest with you, it sort of uh, gave me muscles. You know, we had to run five miles a day, lift weights, you know, like circuit training. So when you're like 17, it's like, yeah, come on. You, you're in competition with the other guys, you know, because oh. we're all, we're all, we all think we're the toughest. You know what I'm saying? I was in a gang called the Tongs and there was other gangs called the Fleet. And there was other gangs called the Combi and they were always having a go. So you had to be fit. So it was one of those things. It wasn't a good experience. But for health-wise, probably one of the best things that ever happened to me because it really got me fit and healthy. You still look fit and healthy, though. Don't worry about that, Lockie. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so where did you, where did your life lead on from there, Lockie? Yeah, when I got out of Boston at 17, I just went about with the boys. We had a gang called the Carlton Tongs. So there was a lot of knife fights and stabbings and slashings and clashes with other gangs. But by the time I got to 19, I thought, no, I, I don't want this. I mean, I was into fashion and dancing, but the gang fighting was all part of it. So at 19, I got married. And that was my way of getting out of the gangs. Now I had a responsibility. I had a wife. She was pregnant. Yeah. So that was me. That was me. The, the gang mentality is like, well, he doesn't have to hang around anymore because he's married. So I, I, I got married and I had a son, uh, his name is Scott. I don't know, did you watch up that Locked Up Abroad link I sent you? Yeah, I did, yeah. Roy probably hasn't seen it. Yeah, that, that's my son who's in it with me. He, he, he got arrested with me. So he was born, and this is crazy, man. This is how it all started. So I'm sitting in my flat in, in Glasgow. I'm 20 now. I'm just 20, 21, just turning up to 21. I knock at the door. A friend of mine's arrives from up from London. And he says, hey, how's it going? He pulls out about a hash and we're sitting smoking a joint and stuff like this. Then he says, hey, you want to take a hit of acid? Yeah, come on, give us a hit. Oh. So we take a hit of acid and we're sitting in the house and whoa, tripping out. <laughs> and I don't know what brainwave come into my mind. I said to my wife, hey, maybe I should go back down to London with Ralph and get a job and I'll send for you and Scott. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's a good idea. A couple of days later, I'm in London. And uh, I'm staying with Ralph. He's him and another guy's got a flat there. And I'm, of course, I'm a th used to be a bit of a thief as well. I went into this shop, a grocer shop, creeped in the back door, opened the safe, and get twelve hundred pound out of it. Nice. Yes, brilliant. Twelve hundred quid, you know. Yeah. So Ralph says, "Hey, why don't we go to Amsterdam?" I thought, what? Yeah, that's a good idea. 
So off we went to Amsterdam, bought a sheet of paper LSD and started hitchhiking from Amsterdam to Belgium, to Paris, to Spain, just hitchhiking, tripping on acid. And eight months had passed. I forgot all about my wife and my kid, you know? Eight months. All of a sudden, I'm earrings and fucking bangles and ponytail and yeah, man, yeah. And I went back home eight months later, I chapped on the door. My wife went, what? Because I never sent a postcard. I never sent a letter. I just lost communication totally. Just totally irresponsible. Just too high to think about anything. Yeah, we've all been there, mate. Yeah, okay. So you know what I'm talking about. Just yeah, get lost. Yeah, there yeah, we go. So my, 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 my wife's... Uh, Mother was my wife wasn't at home, so I went to her mother. My mother in law's knocked on the door and she looked. She said, I'll wait and take a bath, get your hair cut, and go and get yourself a fucking job. I went, Ooh. So I wasn't really welcome back again, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but I, then after that, me and my wife just split up. Then I just went back to London again. What she didn't do, sir? Sorry. She didn't keep you. She didn't want to stay with you, no? No, man. Oh, that, that. <laughs> the way that I looked, you know, the big earrings and fucking, you know, I remember I used to wear the beads and all that and ponytail. And yeah. I mean, just been with you for eight months. I mean, she took you back. Oh, blimey, that's a good woman. <laughs> no, 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 no. But, ah, oh, I forgot to add, she was pregnant when I left. But I didn't know about it. Yeah. So when I come back, I had two sons. Wow. Not one. Blimey. And he was just a baby. And then, oh, no, no, you're not welcome here. No, no, no. So I just eventually left. I, and I went back down to London, hung about with all the London guys, Scottish guys, smoking dope, taking speed, taking acid. Just wild, you know. No, no Not responsible at all. Yeah. And then, then I was luck lucky enough... While I was in London, there was an advert in the paper for painters and decorators for Saudi Arabia. I applied for the job, told me to go down for an interview in King's Cross. Went down to King's Cross. The following day, they sent me to Belgium to do a test, put us in a, an empty room, told us, paint the ceiling, wallpaper the walls, paint the door, paint the windows, paint the skipping board. And they just observe if you can do it. But I, what, that was my trade, painter and decorator. So it was no problem. Okay, that's it. Off to Saudi Arabia. So I went out to Saudi Arabia. This was 75. Yeah, around about 74, 75. And the, the money then, I was getting something like five to six hundred pounds a week. Which wow. is a lot of money, you know. This is, is a lot of money. There's more yeah. Than and if you worked on a if you worked on a Friday, they, they paid you about two hundred quid just for working on a Friday because it's the holy day for prayer. So we get paid like triple triple money. Then I just saved up. I saved up about it was a at a three month contract. Well, not three month three month contract, but after three months, they asked you, you want to go a holiday, or you want to go home. And they pay for your ticket. Then you come back again. I thought, yeah, okay. Then I thought, yeah. Well, I was at the, the work camp. I met lots of Indian guys and different guys from all over the world. And people talking about Thailand and people talking about South America. And I thought, oh, I'll go to India because I've always wanted to go to India. And I went to India. Paid by them. Arrived in India. Oh. Culture shock. <laughs> you know, fucking cows walking along the road. I'm like, what's going on here? But I wasn't really caring. You know, I just, where do you get the hash? And that's all I was thinking about. <laughs> Got a lump of hash, sitting in the little guest house. It wasn't a hotel, just a guest house. Smoking, met other foreigners, and really had a good time. Travelled around India for about three months. I never went back to Saudi. I just stayed there. And then, if you want, then from that, uh, that was, I went back to the UK. And then in 19, this is when the story starts with the drugs and stuff. 
1976, I went back out to India, but my vision was enlightenment, to find my inner self, wow. to find the meaning of life. That's what was in my head, you know, still full of the happy stuff. And I went there, ended up just smoking dope and more dope, went into a, a yoga school, done a teacher's training course for yoga, for yoga for three months. But most of the time, I would just want to smoke dope. So then from India, I traveled up into, into Nepal. Then I was in Nepal, a great time there as well. Just had a good time smoking, met other guys. Then from there, I went to Thailand. And in, in Thailand, the first experience I got, I stayed at a little hotel and I could see these foreigner guys older than me laying back with these beautiful Thai girls. And I was talking with two Swedish girls and they were telling me, oh, they're prostitutes. Said, yeah. What? They're beautiful, young, beautiful women, you know? I said, wow. But I never had any sort of a inclination to join them. I would like to have joined them, but in my mind, I didn't really have enough money. Mm. And my ticket, my next destination was from there. My next destination was Hong Kong. And when that, this is when it all started. I arrived in Hong Kong, stayed in a place called Chongqing Mansions. And the guys that ran the place, the Chinese guys said, you want to make some money? Yeah. Okay. You take technology from Hong Kong to South Korea. Then from South Korea, we, you go on to Japan, get technology again in Japan because Hong Kong, Japan, duty free. And it's a 17 day ticket. You'll be escorted with one of the Chinese guys. It wasn't just me alone. There's maybe six of us, six back, you know, the backpackers. Yeah. So you arrive in South Korea, pass over the technology, cameras, Walkman, calculators, lenses, uh, whiskey and duty free cigarettes. Stay there only three days, off to Japan, same again. They buy all the technology, drop it off in South Korea again, then stop in Taiwan, pick up ginseng in Taiwan, and then drop that off in Hong Kong. Wow. And they pay you $300. I was like, yes, you know, 300 American dollars plus the ticket accommodation is free. It's a lot of money. Yeah, I think, and, and then I'm you can do it again. You can go around and around and around. You can go up every week, if it, up to you. I went about, let's say, the, I went about 10 times. Then I started to calculate. I could buy this stuff myself and just go on my own. <laughs> I don't need to, yeah. yeah, I don't need to do it with them. So that's what I've done. I started, I knew everything to buy because they had supplied it. So I knew all the, the brand names. And then I went myself and the first trip I made about a thousand dollars. Wow. This is, this is brilliant. And then on the way back, another thousand. Cool. I'll make two thousand dollars, whereas before I was making three hundred. Yeah. And then I linked up with other guys doing it. And we, we became a great tight group. Most of them were from most of them were from Canada, believe it or not, but they're from all over the world. Israelis, Canadians, friends, Germans, Italians, you name it. They were there. So, and then there was another route. That was the Hong Kong, Seoul, Tokyo, Seoul, Taiwan, Hong Kong. There was another route to India. The same gear. Technology. So buy the technology and then go to Delhi. Drop it off in Delhi. And of course, I smoke dope. So I think, oh yeah, well, I'll just take a lump of hash back with me. <laughs> oh, take a couple of hundred grams of hash. Get yeah. back to Hong Kong. All the boys, we used to all meet in this bar and you could drink and laugh and joke. And I've got a lump of hash. Everybody's like, oh, come on, use a bit. Come on, let's have a smoke. And then one one time I said, why, why don't you buy some? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. Why don't you bring some yourself? Because you are on the same trip. Oh, no, no. Smuggling hash is different from smuggling technology. You can go to jail for hash, but the technology you couldn't get jailed. Right. But they could confiscate it or you'd have to pay tax. Uh, so then I started thinking, okay, well, I'll just add a bit more. 
And then when I get to Hong Kong, I'll sell it to them. So that's how it started. Right. And I thought, okay, I'm just making an extra, another couple of thousand dollars doing that, just taking a kilo with me. So you wasn't educated. You come up with this idea yourself. Yeah, I just, because I smoke. And then right. I, I always carried it with me for myself. Then, of course, you, you know what like it is. You can't sit and smoke yourself. Everybody's asking, give a joint, give yeah, a joint, or give a, yeah, yeah. a puff. And at the beginning, I was just giving it out, smoke, smoke, smoke. Then I thought, well, well why don't you bring it? Yeah, and then that was their answer. Oh, we can go to jail for that, but we don't right. go to jail for technology. So, how long did that go on for, Lockie? Uh, so I done that with the hash thing, I done that for about a year. And one time when I was in Tokyo, I went to this bar, a, you wouldn't believe it, a Rastafarian bar. Every single person in the bar was a Japanese Rastafarian, every one of them, every single the dreadlocks. And, the music was Rasta Man. Oh, oh, Bob Marley stuff. So I've, thought, I've never seen a Chinese Rasta before. <laughs> no. Oh, this, this, this place was full of them. It was incredible. So, of course, my mind calculator thinks, well, they're Rastas. They must smoke. <laughs> right? So, what, the money, the barman. <clears throat> it's okay if I smoke a joint. No, 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 no. You can not you can go upstairs, smoking upstairs. Here, no. So I went upstairs, took out a lump of hash, and they were all, Zoop. oh, you want to sell? You want to sell? You want to sell? Yeah, okay, I can sell. They offered me $10,000 a kilo. I was like, oh, oh this is going on in my commodities list. Yeah. I'm not only going there for technology. Next time I come back, I'm bringing a couple of kilos of hash. Right, I know, yeah. And the second time I went back, I brought five kilo, five. 50, 50 five. grand in my hand. I was like, oh, man, this is unbelievable. And no, no questions, no try to wheel and deal. 10,000 a kilo, five yeah. kilos, 50 grand. Lucky, can, can, I, can I just ask you a question there? How was you um, bringing it back? <coughs> how was, where was you smuggling it or how was you getting it across? Yeah, well... It was easy to access in Delhi or, or Bombay. It was, I didn't always go to Delhi. Sometimes I'd go to Delhi, sometimes I'd go to Bombay. And sometimes I'd hang around for a couple of weeks, go up into the mountains in Manali and get the hand rub hash. You're yeah. really good quality. So it's easy to buy. Now, the next problem is bringing it in. At the beginning, yeah. I used to put about half a kilo in each shoe, roughly. Right. And four kilos strapped just around my waist. Don't forget, there was no metal detectors. There was nothing like that then, you know. Yeah. They, they, those things didn't exist. So and I just uh, stagger through. First time, five kilos. Then, of course, I started thinking, okay, what about the false bottom suitcases? That make it a lot easier, you know, less risky. Stick five, five kilo in the bottom, check it in. Arrive in Japan, sell it again. So it was easy. It was very, very easy then. And with the first, the second batch of money I got, I went down to the Philippines. But the land now is probably worth a couple of hundred thousand pounds. But I, I, it's a different story. I went, I met a girl at the British Embassy because I had this money. And I didn't want to walk around with it. I had money in the bank in Hong Kong. But in the Philippines, I took with me about, let's say, £10,000. And I didn't really want to be walking about with that in my pocket. So I went to the British Embassy to ask them, can I leave my money here? <laughs> and uh, the girl at the reception went away and come back. Da, 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 da. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, the British Embassy um, can't be responsible for your cash. And I went, yeah, OK, then. So I, I left. And that evening... The reception called up to my room. There's somebody downstairs want to talk with you. Who? A lady from the British Embassy. Oh, really? I went downstairs and it was this receptionist. Who's not a bad looking woman, you know. Young, you know, like a bit younger than me anyway. Oh, I, I just wanted to tell you that maybe I can help you. I said, you work at the embassy. Yeah, but maybe I can help you. I, I could keep the money for you. And if you want to go around traveling, when you come back, I'll give you the money. 
I says, well, I don't know her, you know. So she said, you want to go? We'll go out somewhere and have some food. And she drove a little Volkswagen, you know, the Volkswagen Beetle. Yeah. <laughs> out with her and drove about with the Volkswagen Beetle and we went for a meal and ended up going to bed together that night. I thought, oh, really? right oh, off, yeah. you know. <laughs> so I mean, her became like lovers. And then I said to her, why don't you take a holiday for a couple of weeks? She said, no, I, I could take a holiday for a week. So we went down to this island called Boracay. Beautiful place. You, you can Google it. And she says, oh, that's, this place is beautiful. I said, can we buy land here? And she says, you, you can't buy land, but I can buy land. I said, okay, then. So I went away and went back to Hong Kong. Come back again to the Philippines, met her again, went down to the island, bought this piece of land, and I built a house and opened up a scuba diving school. In Hong Kong, I bought six sets of scuba gear with a compressor. And I had a resort. I'm living in the Philippines on a resort. Lovely. Beautiful, my own house. Yeah. People want to rent the scuba tanks. But I usually just gave them it for free, you know. Just, yeah. You, You'll get money in your pocket. You don't think about it. I'm not thinking about renting it for five quid or something. No, no. I just had a great time, you know, met lots of people from all over the world, like Swedish and French and Italian, all the world travels. And we used to just swim around, go scuba diving. And marijuana there on up in the north of the Philippines, really good bud was about $100 a kilo. So... Take that down to the island. That was it. Just like smoking my head off, fresh fish, lobster. Oh, uh, you don't be jealous now. Yeah, the yeah. Nice life. <laughs> I, I, don't get jealous. I only stayed there for five years. Oh, okay. <laughs> five years <laughs> I stayed there. Oh, no, I'm not jealous old. about that. You know, I'm all right now. <laughs> but everything was so cheap, you know, because the big drink down there is rum. So, right. rum. And San Miguel beer, lots of pot, lots of women, lots of sun, sun, sea, sex. Oh, they're your kids. I didn't want to go back. <laughs> Bet you did. And that, that was that. I started to do that. Then, of course, your money does go down because I, I spend money. I, I'm like that. I just spend, spend, spend. Don't, and I still do it today, but I don't have as much money. But, but the money I do have, I. I don't really care, you know, just as long as I've got enough to eat, dress my clothes. Was you still smuggling bed. at that time? Was you still doing the smuggling while you had all that going on? Yeah. Uh, well, I would stay in the I would stay in the Philippines for you've only got a visa for like a, a month, then you can extend it for a month. But I met some guys on the beach, Filipinos, who oh, the heavy mob, heavy gangsters. Their mother was there, the governor of Mindanao. I went to visit them as well. Everybody going about with Kalajna cloths. And I could tell you stories that's unbelievable during the People's Power Revolution, but it would take too long. Yeah. But I met these. I met this guy on the beach. His name is Tata Pimentel, and he says, uh, "Can I can I use your tanks and stuff like this?" I said, "Yeah, no problem." I said, "When you come up to Manila next time, come and visit me." I went to visit him, and he. I said, "I have to go to Hong Kong now because." My visa expires. Come on, I'll sort that out. Took me to one of his friends in immigration. Got me a permanent permanent residence. So I could live there as long as I wanted to. Just I just gave the guy a Rolex watch, just as if that was nothing. I gave him one of those submariner, submariner's Rolex watches. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I gave it to him. He got me the lifetime visa. So I thought, that's a fair trade. So I would go back to Hong Kong. Then go back on down again to India, and then change the route again. Or oh, go from go from Hong Kong to India to Sri Lanka to Australia. So started going to Australia with the hash. Again, it was ten thousand Australian dollars a kilo. Wow. So I just been around doing that, you know, for a couple of years, you know, just living the life, going around in America, America go around. <coughs> well, why, did you say, why did you say you didn't touch the cocaine side of it, Lucky? What was the reasons? Was it not there then, or no? I just it was a I, when I was one time I went to Holland, not not the first time I mentioned 
A time after that, I went to Holland and I tried some cocaine. And it was really, ooh, it was a good feeling, you know, really high. And then I started to take more and more of it. And then it made me really depressed. You know, it made me like, ooh, ooh. I, oh, I don't know how to explain it. it. Just, it was like a depression. But I slipped into heroin very easy. Oh. oh, my God, that had hold of me for years and years and years. Really? But the cocaine, no, I, I, I don't know why. I, I've been offered it. For example, the day I got out of prison in China, I arrived in London, all the Scottish guys, let's go to the pub, bang, the coat on the table, bang, bang, here, take this, take that. I said, no, no, no. They all looked at me like, what? Lockie, you don't want some coke? <laughs> I didn't even smoke cigarettes. I said, I don't even want a cigarette. I don't even want a joint. I never took a cigarette or a joint or a drink or a, any drug for one full year after I got out of the prison in China. Wow. Oh dear. Then my son's friend came up to his house and he had a fucking joint of weed <laughs> and I smelled it. I went, oh, he's a toki that. <laughs> oh, that was me here back, back on it again. <laughs> Uh, well, look, you, you, look, you just touched there on um, sort of uh, being in jail in China. Can we just ask a little bit about how you sort of ended up in, in the prison there? Yeah, well, I was just going to go on to that. So I told you okay. I was gallivanting around myself. I thought, on the locked up abroad one, you'll see. I contacted my brother in London and asked him, do you know Scott, my son, or... My, my, any sons or my sister's phone numbers, because I don't know anybody's numbers. I've been away for years. He says, Scott's here. Scott's in London. I said, really? You got, he's got his contact? Yeah. Here, there's his phone number. So I phoned him. He's like, what? That? No seen, no seen you for years and years and years. I said, do you want to come out? I'll take you travelling. We'll go travelling around. I'll take you to India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Burma, Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam. We'll just travel around. He went, yeah, okay, okay. So I took him out. The first trip I took him, we met in the Philippines. From the Philippines, I took him to Hong Kong. From Hong Kong, we went to India. Then from India, we went to Bangladesh. And in Bangladesh, we went to Burma. And then from Burma back to Thailand, and he just had a great holiday, you know, just a, maybe it took us about three months, that trip, you know, going around, and he had a great time. Then he went back to the UK. Then I thought, well, what about my other son? I should take him on a trip. So I contacted him. Then he came out. I met him in Thailand. And then from, from there, we went from Thailand to India, to Pakistan, crossed over the Silk Road all the way up through the Karakoram Highway, and then into China, down through China, and into Japan, took a ship to Japan. Okay, but during that trip, <clears throat> I told them, I'm taking dope with me. I'm taking oh, hash. Yeah. He was eh, up to yourself. He also liked to smoke. You know, he was only 17, but still liked to smoke. So we're traveling through China and we get to Shanghai. He says, can I take some as well? I thought, oh, fuck. Yeah, I'm thinking about it, you know. Yeah, okay. Fucking irresponsible father. Yeah, okay, you can take some as well. I would have gave him money anyway, but I don't know what like my thinking was at the time. I thought, well, if he does it, he takes some himself. He'll feel good that he earned his money. So we arrive in Japan, no problem. Up to Tokyo, he's at shopping, buying all that latest sports gear and stereos. I think I gave him 20 grand. And that's a lot of money when you're 17, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I never Wonderful. thought about it, you know? It's a lot of money and I'm 52. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I don't mean, mind fucking 20 grand myself at the moment. Exactly. But anyway, he just... Went back to Scotland, unknown to me, he took a bit, he took a lump of hash with him. And he never told me. And he got bust at the airport in London. But they only find him. They find him about, I don't know, maybe say 
200, 500 quid. They never held him. He just more or less went through. So him arriving with the, all the new gear and the latest stereo equipment and money in his pocket, the other brother's like, oh, fuck's sake, you never asked me to do anything. So you want to come back again? Yeah, okay. Met him in Islamabad. Loaded up myself 20 kilo. You, if you've not watched this documentary, you need to watch it. It's just yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I put five kilos in a false bottom suitcase. And the other 15 kilo just stuffed into bags. Just big lumps of hash. Mm. Wrapped up in plastic and a t-shirt. Stuck at the bottom of the bag. Bang, bang. Pots, pans, knives, forks. Dirty underwear, socks, t-shirts. On top of it. And off we go. We rented the Jeep. The Jeep again take us up right through the Karakoram Highway up to Hunza. Cross the border into China, traveling through China, and then on the train to Shanghai, I start smoking a joint. And I go outside of the, I've got a cabin, private cabin for me and him, but I went outside, you know, you get bored. The train journey's three days. <clears throat> so I'm sitting on the train, bored, you know. I could just go outside, look out the window, smoking a joint. And the ticket collector comes past. He's sniffing. Hmm? Then he just continued walking. But I saw him and I thought, okay, I go back inside again. I said to my son, oh, that ticket collector can pass there. And you can definitely smell it's not cigarettes. It's something else. So we were thinking, okay, let's, shall we throw the drugs out the window? I'm saying, no, 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 no. Just... We can jump off at the next station, just in case. So maybe about half an hour later, this ticket collector, boom, 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 in the door. Ticket. Huh? Ticket. And he put his hand to his lips like this. <laughs> no, no, no. I said, cigarettes. I pull out a packet of foreign cigarettes. No, no, no. And I made a stupid mistake. I pull out a little lump of hash like this. And I said, it's only a piece of hash. And the, he said, opium. I said, no, 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 no opium, no opium. It's marijuana hashish. Give me. So I gave him it. And he, and then he left. Then he comes back again another 10 minutes later. Give me your ticket. So I got in my pocket. Hand him the ticket. And he left again. So me and my son are like, oh, okay, let's get everything packed, ready, and we'll jump off at the next station. So that's what we did. Jumped off at the next station, walked to go through the gate, to go into the road. My son just walks through. I don't have a ticket. I forgot I gave it to the guy in the train. And I'm trying to get out the gate, and they're saying, you need a ticket. And try to take money, you know, here you pay money. And the guy from the train stepped to put his head out the door of the train like that and looking down the platform. And he said, Hoy! something. And they stopped me from going through. Then a couple of guys with the guns are there also, like soldiers. The Chinese police used to carry guns. And that's it. They stopped me. I couldn't go out. And then they took me to a police station. Oh, no, they took me inside the train station, the waiting room, and I was sitting there. I thought, okay, so I'm inside the bag. I told you there's about eight kilos in a small bag. I've got a big bag. It's away at the bottom, but I've got a small one of those day packs. I take the eight kilo out and slip it under, this, under the chair where I'm sitting. And there's a woman in the waiting room, the guard, and she sees me, but I don't know that. And then the other guards come in and say, she says, Points her finger, yeah. And they go over under the chair to see the hash. Okay, that's me arrested now. So taken to the police station, they found this hash, but we've still got five kilos in the suitcase and eight kilos in the bag, in the big deep bag. And that was it. it. Just arrested me. I told my son, okay, you if they ask you any questions. You don't know nothing. You're traveling with your father. 
And basically, that's it. You don't know nothing. I'm just traveling with my father. I don't even smoke, which he didn't. He smoked hats, but he didn't smoke cigarettes. So it was a three-day journey to Shanghai, got arrested, put into a big detention center, and they searched everything. I swear to God, I had to take everything out of my bag. I just left the hash line at the bottom of it. I never pulled it out. I just left it there. Then put everything back in again. So I've still got the hash in the bag. And of, of course, the five kilos is in the case, so they're never going to find that. That's that's sealed. That's professionally done. But the eight kilos lying in the bottom of the bag is still there. Put us into detention, locked me up, and then something like 10 days later, the British consul came to visit me. And I said, look, where's my son? How is my son? Your son? Your son was sent to Hong Kong last week. What? My son's not here? No, your son's not here. Oh, relief. You know, he's been released. And then I was kept there. I was there for 10 months. Eventually went to court. I had a death sentence, life sentence, and the minimum sentence was 15 years. So I was going to get one of the three of them, death, life, or minimum 15. Lucky, I mean, can I just what, ask you there, Lucky, what was going through your mind there when you had that sort of, you know, a death sentence maybe or a life well, in prison over there? I wrote about that. I will tell you the exact words is, my ass was flapping like a choking goldfish. I can imagine, yeah. That's yeah. exactly how it felt, standing in front of them, knowing, it was just like, ass was like that. Yeah. I don't know what they're going to tell me. So, and the funny thing is, when they said 15 years, I was, I wanted to go, yes! You know, <coughs> yeah. when you go down into the detention cell again, you're locked up and you're sitting down on your own. And then you're thinking, 15 years, 15 fucking years for hash? Oh my God. Five minutes before, as if they said 25 years, I'd have kissed her ass. <laughs> but now that, you're sit, now that you're sitting down and thinking about it, you're saying 15 years for hash? That's a liberty, you know? Yeah. So it's funny how your mind can flip and change, you know? So, Thank you. so I just got 15 years. Take the fucking five kilos of hash into the jail with me. Unbelievable. And the eight kilos of hash, my son took it to Hong Kong. Then from Hong Kong, he took it to Japan. You watch the documentary. It's, that's why if you try and tell people about this, it's like, oh, it's a fairy tale. Your imagination's gone wild. It's yeah. a fact. I took five kilos into the jail. My son took the eight kilos out of the jail into Hong Kong, then broke it up, put it in his shoes, and flew to Japan. Sold it and sent me the money to buy it. To, sent me the money to get a lawyer. Buy me. So quite a, quite a, I mean, it's, I'm not promoting or any way trying to glorify or glamorize taking drugs or selling drugs or smuggling drugs, <clears throat> but it's just a wild, wild story. Tell us briefly and, what it was like in that, in that prison, in the, um, where was you, where was you being held? In Shanghai? In Shanghai. What was that like in the prison itself? How did they treat you? What was it sort of the, the um, situation the like? First, the first 10 months, 12 of us in a cell. 12? 12. 12. Oh, oh, and you slept on the floor like like cop, like sardines, like that. You're, 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 there was no space. You just Your body was touching. Really? So there was 12 of us, a hole in the ground for shitting in. So 12 people pissed and shit in that hole in the ground. Jeez. So the stench was terrible. And they kept us there for 10 months. It was hell. I was boils and rashes and scabs. And, oh, it was Lucky. just disgusting. How, how was obviously, obviously, I don't know if you spoke sort of Chinese then or, or was there a language barrier? Did the people speak English to you or? I couldn't speak Chinese. I can speak Chinese now, but then I couldn't. But there was one 
See, you, you don't know these things. They plant a spy in the cell. They plant a spy in the cell to try and get information out of you. What? So there was a guy called Charlie Kai, and there was another guy I used to call him Tai Chi. The Tai Chi's English was fantastic. He was a he was a cracking guy, but this Charlie guy was an informer. He was planted in there. He ended up getting really badly bust up, you know, smashed the fuck. Some gangsters from a different part of Shanghai, they sussed him out and just bang, 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 done him. But he was a grass, or we, we were saying the West, he was a grass, he was a... Snitch. But at that, that point, I couldn't speak any Chinese. But this guy, Tai Chi, could speak English, so I could ask him questions and stuff like that. Then when I moved, I like got there 15 years, they moved me to a prison called T Lan Shaw, which was built by the Japanese. And the, the cells were eight foot by three foot. Very small, no bed, slept on the floor. No bed again. Yeah, no bed. That's Just, uh, know, you know, isn't it? Where's your rights? Wood, wooden slats. <clears throat> and a bucket. A, a wooden bucket for pissing and shitting also. So there was no toilets. There was no showers. We could we could have a wash or a bath, what you would call it. Once a week at the end of the corridor, they had a big room, shower room, with a big, big wooden tub. And you could fill it up with water and, and you just use a scoop, you know, scoop yourself. Shh, wash yourself for once a week. But you could brush your teeth every day and wash your hands and face and stuff like that. They used a plastic, a plastic basin and they'd come around and give you water, like from a, a flowering can. You know, where you flower, you water the flowers. Mm. Now they fill up with water and put it in your plastic basin. Then you could wash and brush your teeth. And that was basically that. That's a, that's a long <coughs> like, time, uh, isn't it? Be terrible. Before you can have a wash. Like a, you have to wait a whole week to have a, a bath or a wash. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy, isn't it? I mean, that, that could probably cause sort of hygiene or diseases and stuff like that. Oh, the the that place way. was covered with rats. You'd like, you'd be like in your cell and, you, 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 and rats would be coming in. You know, oh, no, so, I, I don't like cockroaches and rats and stuff like that. No, but the yeah. Chinese used to love it because they, they would, yeah, and chase them and stuff. Because they, they come out of the cell and they would, yeah. When I was there, Opposite where I was housed in my cell, there was a, a corridor. So you could go into the corridor. There was a long, 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 long table. So everybody sat at that table and we ate, to, we ate our food together. And then there was a window, a bad window. That looked directly into death row. And the floor below me, I was on the third floor. On the second floor was the ones going to be shot the following day. So they took them from death row into my wing, one floor under. We see, you used to see it every morning when we went downstairs. And they'd have sort of a black partition. And the death row prisoner would go in there and they either have to, they offer you, do you want to donate your liver? Do you want to donate your heart? Do yeah. you want to donate your eyes? And, oh, creepy stuff, you know. I would have donated my shell, Lockie. Yeah, yeah. I would have donated your whole self. <laughs> if you can take me out of here, but you're going to be donate yourself. You can took out the box. Lucky, can I can I just ask you there? You obviously you're talking about the uh, the death row. What was that? How they used to kill him off? It was actually shooting them. Like nowadays, you have the lethal injection, don't you? But no, was... boom, back of the head. They used to shoot you in the back of the head. When I got arrested, this is a part of the story, but I've seen this many times, but when I got arrested and interrogated, they kept me inside a, you know, inside a room, and I was on a, like a chair, like a, the old barber's chair, where you get your hands are strapped in, yeah, so you can't move, and they showed me a film, and the film is the back of an army truck driving along a road. Then it stops at the stadium, a gate, and the gate's open. They drive into the stadium. Stop. And then they take, oh, maybe this this particular film, maybe eight people, six guys, two women. And they've got a placard on their chest, you know, like this. Tells you the crime they've committed. That's pinned onto their chest. And, it, and they're roped. 
you're bound by rope, your hands are bound at the back from your neck, rope, and then your hands are bound at the back. So they can hold you like that. And then they just walk you along. They walk them along, kick them at the back of the leg, they drop onto the knee, bang, 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 bang. Just shoot them in the back of the head. Oh, my God. Not with a handgun, with a rifle. Yeah. yeah. So they're showing me this, and then after it telling me, if you don't confess, if you don't tell us what happened, this is what's going to happen to you. Oh, I was, oof. Because I told you on my indictment, I had the death sentence. So they weren't telling me lies. It was possible that I could get shot. Yeah. But when you're actually watching it, you know, oh. it's horrific. You, you never forget it. And yeah. I've seen that many times, even when I got the sentence in the main prison. They, they've got their own TV, prison TV and stuff. And they would show different... They, they were really like any political figure, any communist party member that done that stole money or in some way was corrupt, they made a public execution of it. They showed it to everybody. Everybody could see it. Stadiums, live on TV, and you know they're talking so and so and so and so didn't follow the principles of Mao Zedong. You got a whole big lecture about this, the Communist Party, and bang, 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 bang. Yeah, they, they do it quite often. I, there was I, a guy I, in front of me who stole a lump of copper, a copper block on a, a, tr a railway track. He got shot. Oh, I'm like shot as well. It was government property and could have damaged, possibly damaged the public if there was an accident on the train line. But for yeah. me, I'm thinking, he just stole copper, you know? But he got executed for that. Do, do they keep the death row people on a different wing to the others? Yeah, well, well when I was on the... Th on, I was on the third floor, so the, uh, the wing underneath, the same building, but different landing. The ones that's on the landing below me they will be executed in a maximum period of 10 days. Blimey. So they could be there for two days and executed. But the maximum period of time they kept them is 10 days. Blimey. And so when we go downstairs, sometimes we go down, have to go down into the yard because every morning we had to empty our ship buckets. Yeah. Then you had to take them down three flights of stairs. There was a big trowel there. You emptied your shit into that. Somebody had a hose. They hosed. Shh give it a swirl, throw it away. So we had to pass that floor every morning. And at the death the death row, guys, outside of their cell, there's another prisoner sitting on a stool, facing them like this, looking into their cell. They're never left alone for one minute of the day. So oh, another really? prisoner would, would sit out there and watch them. And then the day that they were going to be executed, all you could hear was getting her head shaved. So you knew somebody was going to be shot that day. And then sometimes we could see out the window and seeing them getting put into the van, you know, tied up. That was very common there because the death sentence is, yeah, it's, it's not really a big deal. It's a big deal for us in the West. But yeah. for them, it's a normal thing. Yeah. How, how did that make you feel, Locky Lock, like when you're seeing other people there for death sentences going out? Was it sort of yeah, a, a relief did. that you didn't get that, or do you still feel like the remorse of seeing them? Yeah, I felt, I felt both of the emotions that you mentioned. There was, it, there was a couple of guys in my in the detention centre you become quite friendly with. One of them was called Fun, Funzi, and the other one was uh, Li Xiaoping. And both of them get shot. But I'd lived with them, right? We slept, as I told you, like this together. Yeah. So that sort of affected me. And Fonzie, before you get shot, you're allowed to write a letter to your family. Okay. So he wrote the letter. And the guy I was telling you about, Tai Chi, he could speak English. He read the letter out to the cell. I was fucking in tears, you know? <laughs> You know, the guy saying goodbye to his mother and his father and his girlfriend and I'm that sorry terrible. that I let you down. Please forgive me. And, you know, all 
and you're like, oh my God. And then you know that tomorrow he's getting shot or he's getting sentenced to death, so he's going to be shot within a week. It's quite an emotional feeling. It's sort of a, and in some way it makes you angry, in some way it makes you hate the government. But it, you, you can't sometimes control your emotions. They just flood up. They just come. So it was, it was sad. And again, you get used to it. Because when I went to the main prison, that was a regular thing. Downstairs, the guys are going to be dead in six days, uh, 10 days. That's a guarantee. But op opposite, I told you, the opposite block, they are all death sentences as well. But their sentences can, can be commuted to life. They've got one more opportunity. They can go back to court and their sentence will be commuted to life. But that's what I've been told statistically, one in ten. So out of ten, nine of them are going to be shot. But there might be one who gets commuted to life. So, yeah, I don't know. You become hardened to it. No hardened to it. It's just, it's no... It's not unusual anymore, you know. It's a it's an everyday thing. Yeah. So after years, you know, it just the skin becomes hard, I guess. It's not shocking anymore. Yeah, I can imagine. Lucky, can I just ask you, sort of, um, obviously, you being in a foreign country, you being a foreigner there, how did the Chinese prisoners treat you, or did they accept you, or what was the sort of going on there? Yeah. Well, I don't know. In Chinese, they used to say. Nalu, you're a foreign prick. That's in Chinese. <laughs> Nalu. Nalu, okay. So, and Chinese is one of the most foulest languages on the planet. Is you must really? know about that. They're always talking about your fuck your grandmother and your fuck. Everybody's a fucking. Oh, the language is so foul, it's unbelievable. Yeah. But. I began to learn how to speak Chinese. So I could say, Chodin Yanis up here, go Hanani, you know, like say, go fuck your mother or break your jaw, you cunt. But in Chinese. <laughs> so you learn it. But because I could play football, they really got, they get to like, though, they liked me. I was good at football, you know what I mean? Yeah. So sometimes we get competitions. You wouldn't believe it. They have Olympic Games inside the jail. Oh, really? Really? There's eight, eight brigades, and every year, once a year, all the brigades play against each other, you know, tug of war and sprints and football and stuff like this. Oh. It's a big thing, you know. Yeah. So I was good at football, so I had a wee crew, you know, my crew. Well, I was part of their crew. There was a guy called Blackfish. Blackfish was the, lead, the leader of the, the triads in my wing. And my brother from London sent me a parcel. You wouldn't believe it. He sent me a parcel, let's say, 20 T-shirts. Every possible colour of pen that you could possibly imagine. 10 of them, 10 of them, 10 of them, 10 of them. Maybe 100 cassettes. Aftershaves. Razors. Remember <clears throat> the Gillette G2 yeah. or G1 or whatever it was with 100 blades. He sent me enough to do a, a whole life sentence. So I had all this gear so I could sell it on the black market, you know. So guy went getting a visit from his wife. Hey, Lucky, can I, can I get one of your T-shirts? Or can you sell me a pen? Or can I use buy, buy a razor blade? So I was doing a bit of trading with, the, with Blackfish. Blackfish was doing all the, the trading. So at the first, that was in the first couple of years. I could even have a cigarette, you know. It was like, ooh. Because the, the discipline, if you get caught smoking, you get beat up badly and possibly six months added on to your sentence. There was one guy there who I met, listen to this, he, come, he goes for a visit and he comes back and he's sitting at the table like this, look. And I'm looking at him, I said, he's taking some smack. He's taking some heroin. He's definitely taking drugs. He was like that. Next day, bang, shot him. Shot him? Yes. Blimey. Just like that, because <clears throat> he'd, he'd taken heroin inside the jail. Nah. Taking it outside the jail is bad. Yeah. 
you're going to get shot anyway. But inside the jail, no mercy. So you had to be really careful. So I smoked sometimes a cigarette because Blackfish had a bit of control. But after he left, that was it. Nothing. No cigarettes, no nothing. Lucky, where are you now in your life? I know you're in Indonesia, but like, where are you, you know, mentally, job-wise? What, what, what are you up to now? Now I'm living in a beautiful... My house is... I've got a three-bedroom house. I've got a rock garden inside the house. I've got a front garden out there with a orange tree and a oh, mango oh. tree. Uh, three bedrooms. Next door is my studio, my art studio. My art studio is bigger than my house. It's massive. Yeah. Three floors. I've got the first floor and then I've got the roof. So I can go up onto the roof and I can go out and look out at the mountains. I'm paying £500 a year. No. No, hell. I'm coming. I'm coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Two extra bedrooms. So... It's a beautiful town I live in. It's called Salatiga. Yeah. It's in central Java. Right. Central Java. They've got a big city about an hour from my house called Semarang. Then there's another place <clears throat> about two hours from my house called Yogyakarta, which is one of the one one of the eight wonders of the world. It has the Buddha Buddha structures. Incredible, massive, massive Buddhist structures so it's one of the wonders of the world but where i'm living totally laid back nothing happens no dancing nobody drinks a muslim country as you know so you don't see anybody with alcohol there's no okay. drinking but you can have a drink if you want yeah you I'll can go to a hotel and yeah, sit and drink yeah. a beer up to yourself well, you seem very very happy mate you seem really like you know you've you found your place you want to stay you're happy there yeah, I love it, mate. I love it. It's just so laid back, you know. The only thing I miss is smoking about weed. <laughs> That's the only thing I miss. But well, I don't... You can't get it out there. You can't get none. Yeah, I could get it, but I'm not going to make that effort because if you get caught, the consequences are pretty severe. Wow. But I could get it, but I think no. And I, I don't want to look for it. I can do it without we really well. We're we're looking like we're gonna wrap it up now, mate, because we're on the hour. So, um, anything you else you want to say, Lee? You want to put over? No, yeah, well, just um, actually... lucky. You've done a little bit of um, sort of turned your life around, and uh, is that correct? You're you're sort of encouraging others to not go down that path and stuff, aren't you? Yeah. Well, I, I've done that. I've done um, an anti-drug exhibition. I put uh, twenty paintings on display. So I've been. I, and here also, I've been to schools here and done, I've got the posters, maybe I'll look them out and send them to you. Yeah. Posters yeah. that are painted and got the children also to get involved. Well, the, maybe their age is around about 10 to 15 and got them involved in painting as well. And also I've been, I taught English here for about six years and at an Islamic university, not far from my house. So I've been doing, I was doing quite positive things, you know, try to help people out in some ways. I just try and tell people, you know, don't glorify or glamorize drugs. At the time when I was doing it, I, I, I was just totally irresponsible. I never get, can you imagine telling somebody, oh yeah, I took my two sons smuggling with me. Yeah. When I'd done that documentary, the flag I got on, would you call that, social media? Yeah. Yeah, fucking bastard. What kind of father are you? And what, how could you do that to your sons? And this, and at the time, I never gave it much thought. I thought, well, what a great guy I am, you know? Not smuggling dope, and you're getting twenty grand, and we're in the mountains in Pakistan, and we've got Kalashnikovs, and blah, 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 shooting the sky. You think you're Rambo? You think it's great until it comes on top, and then when it comes on top, it's a different ball game. Oh, you know. Yeah. Because I told you about the five kilos I brought in the case, right? My youngest son came and picked that up and he got arrested with it also in Shanghai. And they kept him for six, either six or eight months he was inside. And he had a horrific experience, he told me. 
you know, but, but after eight months, because the drugs was given to him inside the prison to him, they knew that he had nothing to do with smuggling drugs. But they still held him for six to eight months and fined him five thousand pounds, and then they let him go. So it's a it's a horror story in the way that the the me and my first son and I get arrested. Then he takes eight kilo to Hong Kong. Then he goes to Japan, which is on the locked up abroad uh, documentary. That's yeah. quite exciting, you know. It sounds exciting. Then the other one comes and he gets arrested with five kilos that I gave him out from the prison, and he's in prison there for eight months. He had a terrible time. He said he fucking pulled his teeth out and oh, he tortured them, and then he eventually gets released and pays uh, five thousand pound. It's then you start to realise, oh my god, you're so irresponsible. You know you're yeah, wrong move. Yeah, yeah, you're a fucking idiot. You know what you're doing, doing some something like that. But at the time, I didn't think that way. We well, are older and wiser now. You're living in Indonesia. You sound like you're having a good time and enjoying yourself, and you've got your nice little art uh, place there as well. So yeah, I enjoy that. You were saying something about putting a link for it because I've wrote, I've wrote a couple of books. All right. This, this is one of them here. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. So they come over a bit. The Saffron Assassin. Yeah, Saffron Assassin. Yeah. And of course, it's just my name at the bottom. That's a very interesting story because. When I got out of the prison in China, I went to stay in Cambodia and I opened a gallery there also. And I was I went into a monastery, became a monk, and done yeah. a meditation retreat. I think I sent you the link, X Gangster Brings Karma to Cambodia's Killing Fields. Did I send that to you? Lee might have that. Have you got that, Lee? Uh, well, guys, I'm having a bit of a technical issue in my end. I can't hear Lockie at the moment. So, uh, Roy, okay, so you, I think Roy, I sent... can you I just said, answer... Uh, Carry on for me because I can't hear. I'm fucking. Yeah, 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 yeah. No worries, me. mate. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, lucky Lee can't hear you, so it's just me and you at the moment. Yeah, I thought I sent Lee a link, a, 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 a newspaper headline: "Ex Gangster I, Brings Karma to Cambodia's Killing Fields." I so I done a, I done a newspaper uh, story, f and that was the headline. And so this book is based on that being in the monastery, then leaving the monastery yeah. and getting possessed by a child inside right. the caves. I went to the killing fields and the spirit of a, a child enters me and I become a serial killer. Really? I become a serial killer of paedophiles. Oh, yeah. And that, that's what the book's about. Yeah, wow. Okay, well, we've got the name of that one now. Anything else you want to promote? You've got anything else going on there, Lockie? Uh, Lee, I sent Lee something like 20 photographs of paintings that i done. Yeah. He said that he will put them on the site or put them somewhere. And Which I also gave him a yeah. link to Bad Boys, I think it's Bad Boys Books. And he said he would put that onto the show also. I, I sent all the stuff to Lee, so he should have photographs of it and the link of where you can purchase the books. Okay, yeah, we're putting them up for you, Lockie. Um, obviously, we've got a bit of a technical problem with Lee on that side. So what what we do? Uh, uh, anything else you'd like to mention or like to add before we uh we finish up for the day, mate? It's been a wonderful interview. But if you've got anything else you'd like to add, no, I think that's about it, mate. I really enjoyed uh, letting some of this out. You know, letting it. Yeah. It's like de-stressing in a way, isn't it? Of course it is. Well, we've enjoyed listening to it, and I hope all the viewers will as well when they uh, get to see it when I've done the editing. Like, like I said, I'll put all the stuff in it that you've uh, you've put up or what you've sent to Lee. I'll make sure he's got it, and he'll send it all to me, and I can put it all on there for you. Excellent. I appreciate yeah, just, that, mate. So you'll send me the link how to watch it also? Yeah, so, yeah it? before it goes out. Yeah, we'll do all that for you, Lockie. Okay, yeah, I'll, just, I'll just jump in there. Obviously, I've, I've lost. Uh, I can't hear Lockie. I've not been out hearing for the last bit. But okay. Lockie, thanks for ever so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Great story. Stay in touch. If anything I can help you with promotions or advertising on social media, just drop me a message and I can do all that for you. And uh, I'll have to watch the interview now to to listen to the last bit of the interview because I missed it. But um, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I don't know what's happened. But uh, I just lost Lockie's Lockie's sound. So. Yeah, no problem. Roy will show you. Oh, Roy, Ray, I should say. Ray will show you later. 
That is Roy. You got it right the first time. It is Roy. What was it? Yeah. So anyway, thank you very much, and uh, I enjoyed your company for the short time that we're here because I'm living alone. Oh, what? So, yeah, I, I was married, but I don't know. I, I just, I think, I think possibly, but by being in China and being alone for so long, I just like my own company. I, I love writing. I love painting. So I can, and I've got. And the occasional fling now and again, but getting Good old, man. you know. That's I'm heading like to 72, so not so active. Well, a different one every weekend, <laughs> mate. That's the best way to go, I've got to tell you. Okay, mate. So you want to finish up now? All yeah. right, Lockie, we're going to right. wrap it up now. Lisa, and see you later. I'm sure he can hear you now. Yeah, Lockie, thank you okay. so much for coming. Really appreciated. Great story. Wish you all the best in the future. Yeah. Thanks for giving me the chance to voice what my experience was and just again to repeat i'm not one to glorify or glamorize crime thank you very much guys no worries thank you good luck okay then bye bye see ya